Hi, this is Dr. Dan Ratner, and today I am meeting with Hassana Fletcher, a mind-body practitioner and licensed marriage and family therapist from Santa Cruz, who brings her unique insights into our shared work. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and I'll get back to you personally. So I'm so happy to have you on our show, Hassana. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. So let's talk about, this is how I usually start off these interviews, your experience with mind-body experience. Um, how did it all start for you? What was the first time you were aware of it or maybe the first symptom you had? I'd, I'd just love to hear your experience. Ah, well, the first symptom um, was in my uh, um, early 30s. and uh, Or actually, it was when I was still in college, now that I think about it. And I had this horrible back pain. And I went to some local practitioner in the little town where the college was. And he said it was because one of my legs was shorter than the other. And so then for years I had to wear, you know, some kind of any new pair of shoes had to have something built up on them. Um, but then I'd say the, the real symptoms started um, when I was about 30 and I had my first child and somewhere in his first months, I began getting horrible back pain. Now, looking back, I understand why I did. But at the time, I thought, oh, I'm carrying this heavy baby around. And, you know, right. so then I started my relationship with chiropractors um, that went on for, my God, 20 years, maybe. And I, you know, there were some really wonderful people, but I was very dependent on that. Um, so then fast forward, and I had been practicing as a therapist, but not knowing anything about TMS at that point. And I had a client who had terrible back pain to the point where she was going to law school. She had to stand up for all her lectures. She would come into the sessions with this big back brace, all this stuff. So I just did you know regular therapy with her, and it didn't help at all. Um, and then... I was away, I think I came back, and she was scheduled for back surgery. And I come back, and she's like almost all better. Um, and I said, well, what happened? <laughs> and she's like, well, my grandmother sent me healing back pain by Dr. Sarno. And I, you know, so I immediately got a copy for myself. And I was early for a chiropractic appointment. I'm sitting in the um, parking lot reading the book. And I felt like, oh, my God, this is me. Somebody must have walked around, you know, taking notes and <laughs> put it in the book. And it was just transformative. But I think I was primed to really believe in it because of her experience. I think that really helped. But also, I, there was just, I was one of these people with the book cures in the sense that I absolutely it lost any doubt. And I just was really on board. To the extent that I went into the chiropractor's office, I think I had six months of appointments scheduled, canceled all of them, returned all the different devices and pillows and everything. And and probably was a couple months after that doing the journaling. Re At that point, there was only that book. No other books were out yet. Right. I don't think the mind-body prescription had quite come out yet. Mm -hmm. So I kept reading Healing Back Pain. Um, and, and journaling as best I could. And I have to say, for anybody out there who doesn't you know, like journaling, I hated the idea of journaling. I was not a journaler. Um, but I just um, found this phrase in Sarno where he said, look for the un, um, unbearable and unacceptable things. And right. I would put that on the top of the page to try and figure out what in the heck to write about and unbearable made a lot of that one i understood it was like really painful things that kind of stuff um but it took me a, a while to get unacceptable and then i began to understand oh that's when i'm having to name things that mean that i'm not as nice a person as i like to think i am and how enraging it is to come face to face with that right Right. And so, and then the judgment that I have about discovering those things, like one example for me was, this was later on, but as a grandparent, I just wanted to be, to be such a better grandparent than, you know, my mother had been. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted to be so perfect. 
And yet there was a part of me was just like, oh, leave me alone already. I'm tired. I don't want to fix you a snack. And then I thought, oh, my God, what kind of a grandmother feels that way? <laughs> and just like judgment, judgment. And I had to just hear Dr. Sarno's voice saying, oh, it's OK. We're just human. The, you know, the, the, the anger doesn't cancel out the love. It's all OK. So I want to highlight a couple things that I'm hearing in what you're saying in your story. Yeah. Because so many people have similar experiences or maybe they have different experiences, but could use a part of the experience that they're not having. I think you're hitting on a couple of key things. And one of them is when it comes to the emotional work, people often don't know what it means, the unbearable or unacceptable. They have to really kind of think about it a little bit because we're programmed kind of to stay away from it. Yes. And that's one thing that, that Sarno does so effectively and in some ways more effectively than all the therapists that I had seen before. Mm-hmm. You know, in therapy, we we invite that. Mm-hmm. But there's something about Sarno where he invites a sort of powerful position on it, like go actually do it. Um, that feels a little bit different. And that's one of the things that I, I work on in my work. It's something that I, I call power, but people can think of it in all kinds of different ways, confidence or strength. And so it does seem like that opened up something for you. Yes. And, um, and at first I was just writing in, in like sentence fragments and, and arrows. And I'd say, you know, uh, conflicted feelings. And then I'd have an arrow and then I'd say rage or you know, I'd say pressure. And then another arrow, rage, you know, so mm-hmm. it's very rudimentary. Yeah. At the, at the beginning. But I like that you gave yourself permission to explore it. You know, it doesn't matter if it starts rudimentary. It just is great that you got kind of started into it. But I wanted to ask one other question in what I was hearing, because another big part of the work that I do that's a little bit different, or, or maybe it has overlap with a lot of TMS uh, or mind-body providers, but um, I just say it differently is the concept of doubt. So obviously this show is called Crushing Doubt. It is about having those doubts and then getting rid of them. And something about the way that you recovered, you were able to move pretty quickly through that phase. Do you know yeah. what that was? Do you know? Well, I think it was that being primed because my the story of my client that I saw suffering for a year and then transformed through reading the book. Yep. So I think that was probably huge. And then I was just one of these people who just responded to Dr. Sarno. Um, at that point, just the book, there wasn't YouTube. There wasn't, I mean, eventually I bought a, um, what was it in those days? Not a deep, it wasn't even a visual thing. It was just whatever, audio tape or something yeah. of him yep. giving his talk. Or no, mm-hmm. I guess there was, it was a DVD. Mm-hmm. So I, I did mm-hmm. see him. That's right. So, um, but so there's dispel, okay, so about him that dispelled doubt for me, yeah. So, and let's think about what that was because one of the things I want to lay out for people is how can you get past doubt? Mm. Plenty of people they have so much doubt that it just it takes longer, and there's no I want people to not be critical of themselves about that. But for people who can get past it fast, maybe we can find the elements that really. Okay, so here I, like I was it, with my back, the specific, this back pain, and I had been told by the chiropractor with a back like mine, I would always be in pain. Uh, I was also told, um, oh, I should, all, oh, yeah, let me add in here. Um, so I had, I had already had um, two unnecessary shoulder surgeries. Mm. The first pain was in one of the shoulders, and um, they told me it was a rotator cuff tear. And I had to have surgery, did that. A couple months later, um, the other shoulder started hurting and, and had no symptoms before that. So then they said, well, you must be using th- that shoulder now more, more, you know. So then I have surgery on that shoulder. So then I develop hip pain. And it's at that point that I read the Cerno book. But I was told at that point, and here the aging comes in, that it was aging and it was going to just get worse. And I was... I don't know, maybe 50-ish at that point. Um, So you'd think 20 years later, that would be a lot worse, you know, but I don't have any hip pain now. And that is something that we definitely, I want to get into in a a minute or two, because 
you are, this is by your own words, I'm not saying this, but you, you are on, on the relatively older side of a lot of the mind-body practitioners out there. And it gives you a, a, a unique perspective. And I've always wondered about this. How can I help people with doubts about aging? So I will get to that in a second. But before we do that, I was thinking, I want to highlight that you knowing somebody that got better from this was very key in you being open to it. And then when I read Dr. Cerno, yes. And then when I read Dr. Cerno, he specifically talked about some of the things that I had experienced. He, like he talked about rotator yeah. cuff. It didn't have to be. And that fit with me like, well, that explains why, you know, after I have the surgery, a powerful placebo, then it starts in the other shoulder. So a lot of it really. Yeah, that's that. Well, that's what it was like for me. I, I wasn't primed by anybody having the experience. I didn't know anybody who had had the experience. I didn't witness that. That would have been really powerful. But you're right. The way Sarno talks, and I don't know if this was true for you, but the way he described my personality oh, was oh, mind-blowing. Yes. that That's the part where I said I felt like he walked around behind me taking notes. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's... And this is part of what I work with. It, it, the science is incredibly important, but so is the logic. It has to add up. And I think both you and I felt that what Sarno was saying really added up on a lot of levels. So just for the people watching out there, it's great for us to highlight the things that can help us get over the doubt. And I try to help people answer questions as they go if, they, if they're having doubts. But those things are good things to fall back on. Now let's turn to this issue of aging. Tell us what your experience is with trying to parse out what's aging, what's mind-body, what's your take on it? I'm, I'm totally curious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that, that helped me a lot was um, the conversation I had with one of our wonderful TMS doctors, um, John Strack. And when I asked, was talking, I was saying to him, you know, I have the stiffness in the morning and, you know, and he said, I always tell my people that the first hour of the day doesn't count. Don't worry about anything that happens in the first hour of the day. And so I did that. And then it would just disappear. Now, if I hadn't, if I didn't understand that, it, you know, how TMS worked, I would just um, I'd be worried. I would be anxious about it. And it would just get worse and worse during the day. But that way, just thinking, you know, and I would have this little mantra, it's only TMS, it's only TMS, and just go about as best I could, you know. Mm -hmm. I sort of identified with my cat, which who's an aging cat, and she would stretch a lot in the morning, you know. So, um, but then there would be no pain the rest of the day. So that's which, one Which, you know, I don't know how you think about it, but, uh, when I hear something like that or when I experience something like that, it's if we're going to deny certain facts, we're going to lose all kinds of data. And that's a piece of data. The fact that you changed your thinking and suddenly it wasn't hurting as much. I understand the logic behind the idea that we would have more pain as we age, but it turns out it's not true at all. We do go through changes as we age. And this is the way I think about it. So I, I want your guidance on this because you're more experienced in this. But I think that we go through changes, you know, bodily changes, but none of them hurt. And the, one of the ways I think about it is it's like with eyesight. Our eyesight gets worse over time, but it never hurts. Yeah, that's a very, I like that, uh, you know, analogy. Um, yeah, and I think I was lucky because my um, GP here, it was also somebody who was very interested in in this approach. And I think he even went and, and studied with Sarno for, you know, a month or so. So he was very open to this. I remember him telling me, uh, and we worked together, I would refer to him, he'd refer to me, but, and he was telling me about a, a patient he had whose hands were just gnarled up with arthritis and there was no pain. Right. So um, this is when I was younger, when he was telling me that. So then years later, I wasn't remembering that, but and I developed this funny um, bump in my finger suddenly and it hurt and I was worried about it. And I went to the doctor and then they prescribed antibiotics. They didn't know what it was, this whole thing. And 
then it clicked after a while. I thought, wait a minute, I think this is arthritis and that doesn't have to cause pain. And the pain went away. And then some months later, the same, the other finger and the other hand started getting that same kind of bump. But it, I just thought, oh, that's, that's arthritis. Um, I don't have to worry about it. And there was no pain in that. Right. It, it, wouldn't it be great if we had started to think about the term arthritis as just like a, a, a little harmless growth as opposed to something painful. When I was growing up and I heard the word arthritis, the number one association I had was pain. Yes. That's what everybody thinks of. But yeah. if we can think of it as just something that develops but doesn't hurt, it really is like freckles on the skin. Sometimes people talk about it's like gray hair, but the the, the tricky part about that is your hair doesn't have any nerve cells, <clears throat> so it never hurts. But your eyes changing and not hurting or freckles changing and, and not hurting, we can have all these internal changes. So let me ask you this. Have you, has that ever been a challenge for you since getting all this information as you age are there still times where you, you struggle with that and you say, I don't know, maybe this is aging or does that doubt creep in? Well, so far I haven't had a symptom that is, you know, that has scared me or made me wonder what is it? Um, in, for instance, this is not an aging thing, but once, I mean, I was used to having, and I want to say to people out there, yes, I had this you know, like almost like a book cure with, with Dr. Sarno in a short time after reading it. But then that doesn't mean that I haven't had symptoms over the yeah. past 20 years. Right. I absolutely have, but I've never, what I don't have is fear anymore. I, right. You know, whatever it is, I'm, I'm not afraid. Yeah. Um, except once I had just gotten off the phone um, and all of a sudden I had a horrible pain in my jaw and I, that was not an area that ever had pain before. So I didn't know it. And I, and I was worried. I thought, oh, my God, I've got to go to some specialist. What's happening here? I can't function. And then all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute. I think this is what, uh, you know, it's TMJ. That's a TMS thing. You know, and then immediately the fear went away. And then I just thought, well, what, what, what was just happening? And I realized I was just talking to somebody who I knew I had to be very careful with and really, like, clench back any, any emotion. And, um, you know, so within a couple of hours, or, I mean, the pain just started just going down very quickly. And I, I like the way you highlight that, though. And it's something that I say often that it doesn't matter how quickly you get better initially. Afterwards, I think of it as kind of the human condition. We're all going to have mind-body symptoms throughout any given day or any given week or any given month. We're going to have things pop up. And to me, the key is understanding it. So now I wanted to hear a little bit about how did you shift into doing the work? How did you, how did you um, start to work with clients on this once you oh, realized that, that? Yes, that work. Not yeah. your personal work on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I actually, um, how did the how did that happen? I, it became clear to me that I felt like, oh my gosh, I want to share this. This is incredible. I don't want people to be suffering. So at first, just my regular clients who were not coming to me for that, but they would mention, oh, I think I'm going to have to have shoulder surgery and I go in high alert. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> right. But then you run it. So if so, and I, and that was hard because sometimes, you know, people, they weren't open to that. That's not why they came to me for it. That was just an incidental thing and they were here for other stuff. And so that, so that, that could be hard because not everybody was going to be open to it. Um, right. Right. So, it, it, and then I, so I think, yeah, my GP did start referring people to me. So they were coming who were already open to this. And so that, that made a big difference. Yeah. And now, do you see patients about mind-body issues exclusively now? Yes. Okay. Because it, I just, and I can, I barely have enough time for that. So right. I, but, you know. I, I, On the other hand, I find that, that my whole training as a therapist, because often it's relationship issues that are, you know, part of what's causing the pain. It's various things that my training helps me with, as mm -hmm. opposed to just being a TMS coach or something. 
Yeah, I and I'm totally in agreement with that. I, I the fact that I have a lot of therapy experience yeah. makes it so much more effective the mind body work that I do, which is not not to say anything disparaging about mind body coaches who don't have the training, but it just I felt lucky that I could bring this kind of information um, in that dual way where I really understood both. But the other thing that happened for me, and this is really interesting, I have some patients that I have been seeing for a, a, a long time over the duration of the time that I became a mind body therapist as well. And it's like you said, sometimes I would with some of them, they were open to it and I got them some mind body help. But the other thing is it really changed my whole thinking about therapy in general, because I felt like, wow, we're kind of ignoring some major information that's coming in. Mm -hmm. So Sarno talks about um, mind-body symptoms as a distraction away from, uh, you know, emotional life. I don't disagree with that, but I actually just think it's only one of the functions. And I think another function is it's a communication. Yes. The body's saying something to us that way. Often Mm -hmm. it's saying no to something that we're doing. Yes. Or it's saying no to us not doing something. You know, Ah. it's really interesting. Yes. But um, the idea of it being a communication, I think, is so is so important. And so when I think about therapy in general, it's hard for me to not incorporate it into my my work, you know, because now I'm like, okay, well, I'm hearing this is happening and I try not to be pushy about it, of course, but it has altered my way of doing therapy. And one of the ways is that it's altered, and I'm curious what this is like for you as a mind-body coach and a therapist. Um, I found that disclosing my own experience was something I was taught in grad school not to do. And yet it was so important for getting people better in this way. I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit, how, what your experience has been of that. Yeah, because people, it's so encouraging to them if I share my experience in that that I had unnecessary shoulder surgery, you know, just the whole thing, and that and that it's it, yeah. So it's so I think one of our main jobs is to help encourage people along this um, less traveled path. Yeah, and and it's hard. Well, it's kind of like you you said when you had the experience of a, a client getting better that fast. It was a, you know, living, breathing person that you knew that had been through the changes. And when we share that, and this is one of the reasons I like all of these um, personal stories of of recovery, they're very powerful to lending themselves to, okay, I I can understand. And and this isn't like a, you know, a cultish, uh, like religious, I've been healed kind of experience. It's science and logic. And it actually... I don't know if you've had this experience, but I sometimes look back on the old theories and I laugh because they sound so illogical to me. Um, things like herniated discs oh. causing back pain. Oh. I understand the logic. It's not yeah. like it's totally weird or anything, but it doesn't correlate. There's so many ways it doesn't correlate. And that, so now I look back on that and, and kind of laugh and think, no, this isn't me being illogical to believe these things it's the other way around yeah and i want to say a little bit more about what you um, the point you made about you you know you and i are talking about going a little bit beyond what dr sarna was saying but now some of the other doctors certainly are on board with the idea that it's these symptoms are a way of communicating something to us that needs attention that we're not paying attention to otherwise yeah so there you can look on them as a gift even though it's can i use bad language here we're not really. <laughs> you, 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 okay, you can. I'll just, Go ahead. I'll, no, no, no. You use yeah, what you want. A GFO, um, a, yeah. a golden effing. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay. I, I love that you have that in your in your in your lexicon, though. That's good. It because is. It really is. You you think at first, oh my god, there's never going to be a way that I'm going to be grateful for these symptoms, and yeah. almost everybody by the end of treatment really sees how it's. They would never have done, made some of the changes they did without this motivation. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's a great point because there's no way that you can feel grateful for them while you're having the symptoms. I am truly grateful I had the symptoms because it changed my life. And actually that brings me to, let, let's finish on this point and then you know, we're going to have more conversations over, over the years, I'm sure. But 
one of the things I found in my getting better is I didn't just get better from the symptoms. I also got better in my life. Mm -hmm. Like my, I, and that's where this whole idea of the power column uh, work that I do comes from is I realized that I had been doubting myself and not being in my own corner and not aligned with myself. And, and I had decades of therapy trying to address these things. And it's nothing against therapy in general or the therapists that I had, although my therapist now is, is even better because I'm, I selected it with this, selected them with this in mind. I became more powerful. And I find that that is true when I work with people all the time. They, they become more powerful or happier or more full in some way. Is that something that you've seen in the work? Yeah, and I'm, gl I'm glad you're bringing this up. Um, the, one of the things, when I think of like what allows for recovery, and, I, and if I have to boil it down to two things, one is um, related to what you're saying. It's being uh, what I just call learning to be on your side instead of on your case. <laughs> I like that. And so for people to, to see the ways in which it's just so habitual to have this double standard where they're kind to other people and so hard on themselves. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, Dr. Sarner talks about the rage that this kind of, it's a form of self-criticism, what it, that it generates, which adds to the reservoir of dangerous or volcano of dangerous feelings. So one way to lower those feelings is to not be generating that kind of internal criticism and rage. Absolutely. And one of the distinctions that I have made, at least with myself, but I've seen it applied to other people is I pretty much always liked myself in many capacities, but I wouldn't say I loved myself. Mm. It was really different when I recognized the core part of myself that was wounded and not feeling good about myself. So it, I just want to highlight that you can like yourself and hate yourself at the same time. And that's certainly something I had. And the, the, the number one thing that changed that for me was pain. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable to think, but it really is true. Yeah. I think that's, that's true. Your body's saying something really needs attention here and you're motivated because of the pain to, um, I use inner child work a lot to help with this being learning to be, you know, kinder and accepting of yourself. That's it's great because if you if you frame it as a little child, would you really do that to a little child? Yes. Yeah. But we do it to ourselves. So this has been a great conversation, Hazana, and I, I'd love to have you back on sometime soon. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that I can learn so much from each practitioner that I talk to about the way they're thinking about it, and I also love to share how I'm working because one of the things I'm hoping for is to alter the national dialogue over time, and I think these voices all ringing out together and talking about it is key. So I appreciate you being a part of it and I look forward to having you on again soon. Thank you. And thank you so much for doing these. I, I, you know, just discovered them recently and they're, I'm referring them to people, to my people a lot now. So. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Hassan, and I appreciate you see the value in them. Um, I'm not surprised though, because we're, we're very like-minded. We've had very similar experiences and um, I'm happy for you that you went through that process mm -hmm. and I think have lived a much happier life because of it. Same with me. Yes. So oh. we'll keep comparing notes and thank you for coming on. Oh, lovely to be here. One thing I love about all of these interviews is they all bring a very different perspective. And one of the th uh, things that I was most excited about, about talking to Hasana is that she understands the overlap between mind-body work and what I would call the trigger of aging. Because as people get older, there are all of these things that we assume are going to be bad or painful. And I, I was really struck by her talking about getting arthritis and having that physical change, but realizing that it didn't cause pain. These are the kinds of things that are, are great breakthroughs for a person personally, but they also can be utilized by the rest of us to know we don't have to worry about this. You know, when I think about Hasana as I age, it's a great comfort to know she's been there already and it did not lead to pain, just like they say in the studies and in the books. 
So that's one aspect. But there was also, as usual, a lot of confirmation about things. Um, one of the things I was really struck by is in her reading of Sarno, I know she's one of the cases that got that book cure, got better faster. But she did say, I have other symptoms. It's not like it's just gone. So if you don't have that book cure, don't worry about that so much because that is about doubt. And I enjoyed getting to talk to Hassan about that. But one of the things that was most convincing to her was the same thing as with me, which is how well Sarno described our personalities. There are people out there who don't have that personality, though, and I just want to highlight that, too. That doesn't mean you can't get better. It just means that that may not be an active part of the process that's going on for you. So there's lots of ways to get better, and every time I have somebody on, I feel that more and more. We have a lot of overlap between us, but there's also different ways of thinking about things. So it was a pleasure having Hassan on. We'll have her on again soon, I'm sure. And I appreciate you all watching and listening. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and I will answer you personally.